Some of you will know that I teach a course called Preaching from the Parables, but somehow uh, this little gem has largely escaped my notice. In all of these years, I've never preached on it until now. Uh, maybe that's because, so, like so many of us, I have a uh, little sense of what scholars call imminent end expectation. I don't actually expect Jesus to turn up any minute demanding an account of my stewardship. Uh, we, we don't imagine there to be any danger of Jesus, the cosmic terminator. I'm back. You know, descending from heaven with bright lights and heavenly brass and a choir of angels, at least not anytime soon. Which is precisely why we might want to give this little parable our full attention. You also must be ready, Jesus tells his disciples, for the Son of Man will show up at the very moment you least expect him. Well, at least in Luke, there are actually two parables here, uh, told together in such a way that the, the second parable actually can't be understood without the first. So I invite you to in indulge your exegetical curiosity by opening your Bibles to Luke chapter 12, verse 35, those verses earlier. Uh, but before we get into the parable itself, I think we need to prepare to hear it the way Luke's own audience would have done. Because at least where we're concerned, the parable is about a, a very unfamiliar social situation. Why? Because it concerns slaves. To be a slave is to be bought and paid for, body and soul. To be a slave in the world of that day is to have little or no say in, in the direction of your life. To be a slave is to, to live and die by the whims of your master or your mistress. The Roman poet Juvenal, who died around 130 AD, recounts an argument between a Roman matron and her husband. Crucify that slave says the wife. Why, says the husband. What has he done? Where are the witnesses? At least give him a fair hearing. No, she replies, I'm paraphrasing here, you are a fool and he is not even a man. My will and my command are all the authority I need. In one of his satirical poems from the first century before Christ, Horace, another Roman poet, depicts a master who crucifies his slave simply because the slave tasted the fish soup while bringing it to the dining table. Ancient Roman theater is full of gallows humor. On stage, slaves regularly taunt one another with the threat of crucifixion, crooks, they say. Or they lament that this will be the common fate of every one of them. Well, of course, we don't need to be slaves in the world of Jesus' day, or Greco-Roman, or Jewish, to recognize a profoundly abusive and dangerous relationship. So I invite you to imagine what it would have been like waiting in the wee hours of the morning for your master to arrive home from the wedding festivities, like the slaves in this parable. If he comes in the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them ready, blessed are those slaves. Well, will he be in a good mood or drunken, surly, perhaps a little frisky? They all jump when the knock comes at the door. But whether you hear this parable first from the lips of Jesus or sometime later because you've heard the Gospel of Luke read, what happens next is simply unimaginable. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them recline at table and serve them an early morning meal. Well, this is sheer fantasy. Silence falls on every listener. Because this is not, in any world, how real masters treat real slaves. So be ready, says Jesus. 
because the Son of Man is coming at the very moment you least expect. Uh, Peter, blessed, clueless Peter, Peter has a question. Lord, is this a general purpose parable applicable to everybody? Or is it tailor-made for members of the inner circle, for us? Well, as you know, before, long, uh, before too long, the, the disciples, the twelve, will be arguing amongst themselves as to which of them is the greatest. But already, I think, they have a sense of privilege, a sense of being set apart and above the common masses, because the Messiah of Israel has chosen them. So Jesus tells the parable again, this time with a twist. Who then is the faithful and prudent manager, head steward, whose master puts him in charge of the household staff to give them their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom the Lord will find hard at work when he arrives. Truly, I tell you, he'll put that one in charge, not only of all the other slaves, but of everything he possesses. But then again, if that first slave says to himself, well, now, Master seems to be taking his time. If he begins to beat the other slaves, men and women, to eat and drink and get drunk. Well, let's just say in that case, things definitely will not end well. Something about being cut into pieces and consigned to outer darkness. So Peter has his answer. At least, as Luke tells it, this is a parable for ecclesiastical middle management, for stewards or slaves who are given responsibility for the care of their fellow slaves, or in our case, for disciples who are given charge of other disciples, all bought and paid for. Yet even if we can push the parable this far, to supply those other disciples with their life-giving sustenance at the right time, the very necessities of life. Can we push it even further still? It's Jesus' warning for pastors and professors, preachers, even theological students, everyone who's involved in ministry, to care well for those who are in our charge. Okay, so then what exactly is his point? It's not as if Peter is likely to actually recognize himself in this portrait of a steward who takes his own authority a little too seriously, uses his fists on the household staff, lets himself into the pantry, and ends up drunk to boot. Um, just wondering, but in what way does that resemble any member of the pastoral profession, any seminary professor whom you know, any mid-level ecclesiastical manager. Well, in 2011, a woman named Jennifer Herrick in Newcastle, just up the coast from Sydney, Australia, lodges a complaint with the Catholic Church alleging that a priest with the unfortunate name of Tom Knowles had maintained an unwanted sexual relationship with her for 14 years. The church pays her compensation of $200,000. Father Tom is placed on administrative leave. And two years later, he returns to pastoral ministry. According to an article dated August 8, 2014, in the Australian newspaper, the victim is now suing for an unspecified additional sum. And for the record, none of my relatives lives in Australia. May 18, 2012, a jury in Dallas, Texas, uh, sentences 53-year-old John M. Fiala to 60 years in prison for attempting to hire a hitman to murder the teenager who had accused him of sexual abuse four years earlier when Fiala was the priest at Sacred Heart of Mary Parish in the rural community of Rock Springs, West Texas. According to his lawyer, Fiala hadn't actually intended to carry out the killings. My guess is that's why he hired somebody else. New York Times, October 23, 2013, reports that Pope Francis has removed a German bishop by the name of Franz Peter Tepperts von Elst for having spent more than $41 million, all figures U.S., on renovations to his residence and other buildings. This includes a $200,000 bathtub, go figure, a $1.1 million landscaped garden, and plans for an 80-square-foot fitness room. That's nearly the size of my house. October 2014, see one year at a time here. According to the BBC, thousands of uh, uh, Twitter users in Kenya 
are tweeting the hashtag pants down to discuss morality in, you guessed it, the Anglican Church of Kenya, following a YouTube video that goes viral of a married pastor caught, well, with his pants down in a hotel room with somebody other than his wife. Now, his defense is that they'd simply met for prayer. I'm really tempted to say something about somebody's prayers being answered, but I know that'd be inappropriate. So there you go. Look, my, my very informal internet research on misbehaving clergy started out, I, I, for me at least, as mildly amusing, but in the end I, I found it profoundly depressing. The bulk of the discussion concerns sexual abuse, but that's actually only one of the more prominent forms of pastoral abuse, pastoral misbehavior, that's really to be found throughout all segments of the church today. From the Protestant side of things, you can find no end of online articles with titles like this. These are real articles. Is your pastor a serial bully? Thugs in the pulpit. Ten ways to spot spiritual abuse. How to spot a manipulative church leader. And my favorite of the lot, wife beaters and abusive preachers, let's arrest the violence. Now, that article actually concerns a a, a Pentecostal bishop named Thomas Weeks III, who, according to reports, was arrested and charged in August of 2007 for kicking and punching his then-wife, Juanita Bynum, in the parking lot of an Atlanta hotel. His defense was, the devil made me do it. I kid you not. And if you have the stomach for it, websites such as batteredsheep.com and thehopeofsurvivors.com list many, many, more equally depressing case histories, as well as resources for those who are hurting. But if that slave says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, and if he begins to beat the other slaves, men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And all around the room, Peter and all the other disciples begin to say, Surely not me, Lord. You see, Peter, Peter wants a parable just for them. Jesus gives him one. And not a single one of us here today is happy that Jesus seems to be warning us against bad behavior before we've done anything wrong. So what exactly is his point, at least if I've read him correctly? Well, I suppose it depends on how deep we want to go. Most obviously, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. That was the conclusion to the first parable, the general purpose parable. Eschatology is important. When you know that you're going to be called upon to give an account of your stewardship, chances are you act accordingly. Those who are faithful over little will be given charge over much. Now, that's the conclusion, I know, of a different parable, but it fits here as well. Truly, I tell you, he will put that one in charge of all his possessions. So our classes, our congregations are not ours to do with as we please. We're we're dealing with someone else's property property people who have been bought who for whom the Lord has paid in blood. That's the exhortation in 1 Peter chapter 5. Do not lord it over those in your charge. If you love your Greek, katakurien means to act as though you yourself were the Lord. You were, you were the Lord. But only Gentiles do that. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. Now, all of those are legitimate implications of this parable, all part and parcel of what Jesus intended his under-shepherds to hear. But, but surely not, if I've again read it correctly, not the heart of the matter. Al-Hakim al tirmidhi was a ninth century Persian Sufi scholar, which is to say an early scholar in the tradition of mystical Islam. I have absolutely no idea of his source, but according to Al-Tirmidhi, and I quote, it is related 
that Jesus said scholars are of three kinds. He who knows God and his commandments, he who knows God but not his commandments, and he who knows God's commandments but does not know God. Well, it's apocryphal, of course. But it it helps me understand what I think is going on in this parable. Jesus tells these parables not simply so that Peter, the apostles, and all the rest of us in ecclesiastical middle management will know what we should or shouldn't do. That's the easy part. He tells these parables so that we will understand why. We can learn to stay faithful no matter how long it takes, simply out of enlightened self-interest. The choice between being drawn, quartered, and cast into eternal darkness in the company of the wicked, on the one hand, or being crowned with glory and trusted with still more, on the other, I don't find that a difficult choice. Or we can remain faithful stewards of our flocks, providing them rich and regular sustenance, no matter how long the Lord tarries, out of loving concern for them. They've all been bought and paid for. They're precious in his sight. They deserve as much good reason. But, but I think there's a, there's a third reason better than the other two. What the slaves in the first parable and the steward in the second parable seem to forget is what kind of Lord they serve. And I think that's the point Alter Medi was trying to make. That when it comes to faith and faithfulness, who we serve explains why we serve and how. This, after all, is a Lord, a master, who does the utterly unexpected. All he asks is that we serve him in the persons of those whom he has bought and paid for. And and if we will do just that, he says, then upon his return, he will serve us in a way no other Lord ever would. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, familiar verse, the, the words of the risen Lord, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. For whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will enter in and eat with you and you with me. Even better, the words of the incarnate Lord, later in Luke chapter 22. A dispute arose as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest, but he said to them, it's the kings of the Gentiles who lord it over them. But not so amongst you, rather the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at table? But I, your Lord, I'm among you as one who serves, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Any moment, any hour, any day, a place at his table. At the very moment, in fact, that we least expect it, that much he promises. Well, these are the conditions of stewardship. Whether for pastors, preachers, seminary professors, anyone else in Christian ministry. But all in the knowledge that this is a a Lord like no other. A Lord who asks little and gives much. A Lord whose ultimate desire and ultimate purpose is not to be served, but to serve. Blessed, blessed are those servants whom the Lord finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will gird himself and set them at table and serve them. So be ready, says Jesus, for the Son of Man is coming at the very moment you least expect him. Amen.